I suspect everybody is afraid of something. What are you afraid of? Spiders? Snakes? Ugh. We were on a youth trip. We took a youth group out to Colorado to an international youth rally. And we had parents driving several vans. And while we were up in the mountains of Colorado coming down into Estes Park, all of a sudden one van pulled over to the side. So we all did. And there she was, uh, the mother of one of our students, frozen to the steering wheel, having a panic attack, terrified of the drop-off on the sides of the mountain roads. Maybe you're afraid of heights. I gave this quite a bit of thought while I was preparing the sermon. I was trying to think, what am I afraid of? (laughs) One thing came back to mind. Do any of you remember the old Wisconsin State Fair? Uh, You'll have to be about my age, 35, 40. (laughs) Um, remember when they had permanent rides at the state fair? You know, there was a bombardier kind of thing that went around. There was a Ferris wheel there. And there was a ride called the Wild Mouse. Who remembers the Wild Mouse? Two? Okay. It was, it was terrifying. It was terrifying. You, it was like a roller coaster. It went up and down and turned, okay? Except there were no rails on the side, no railings. Like on the big roller coaster where they did have those wooden rails, like that would help if a roller coaster is going off the edge, those little wooden railings. But on the Wild Mouse, nothing. And so you'd, you'd get on at the, at the station where you get in, and there were only like four people in a cart. And you would go up this hill like a roller coaster, and then you go straight, and you get to the end, and there is nothing in front of you or below you. It's terrifying. It's like you're going to go right off the end of the, And then the cart turns. And then it goes over this way to another end. Nothing in front of you. And then it turns and it comes back. And then they zigzag back and forth. Every time you got to a sharp curve, it was like an S curve, it was like you're going to go off the rails. Hated that ride. I hated it. I only rode it like 10 times. (laughs) I was 12, 13, 14 years old. And we dared one another to ride it. So you had to. You have your own things that terrify you, whatever they might be. This dream that we're reading about, Daniel today, gives us something that's very terrifying. And um, when we read it, it's the kind of thing you don't want to dream about. It quit qualifies as a nightmare. This Bible lesson from the last chapter of Daniel is that kind of frightening thing. You you know Daniel. You learned about him in Sunday school. Daniel was one of those four Israelite people who was taken from the captive caravan uh, into the court of King Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar trained these four Israelite men to be his advisors. They're very intelligent young men. Well, you know Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were the ones thrown into the fiery furnace. And you remember that Daniel was thrown into the lion's den because he wouldn't bow down to the king's statue. But something that we didn't learn about in Sunday school was that Daniel is also a prophet, like Isaiah and Jeremiah and others. He received messages from God. He had visions from God that he passed on to the people. This morning we're reading about Daniel's vision of the Son of God who is describing the end of the world, the end of all things, the end of time, and judgment of the wicked and the righteous. Now Daniel's presentation of this is rather brief. It's our text for today. There was a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. That's all that Daniel has to say. But there are other inspired writers of the Scripture who tell us more and make this dream even more terrifying. We read from Matthew, Peter, and the book of Revelation. Matthew, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky. Peter, the heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, 
and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. And Revelation, the sun turned black, the whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to the earth. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. If I dreamt that just before I woke up in the morning, I would probably wake up in a cold sweat. To be sure, on that last day, there's going to be even more going on. To be sure, Satan and his forces will also be there to make their last effort at stealing souls from the kingdom of God. One last battle surge. We aren't told exactly what that will be like, but I can imagine this. The devil or his minions are going to accuse you with your conscience or maybe even with Bible verses. Try this one from Psalm 24. The devil may quote to you, Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. <laughs> That's not you, the devil will say. And then maybe he'll come back with a few more. Other verses that you might remember. The soul that sins is the one who will die. Now that's you. Or all have turned away. They have altogether become worthless. There is no one who does good. No, not one. And God was talking about you. Remember all those things that you did poorly? Okay, so I'm already seeing the whole destruction of the earth. I'm seeing res the resurrection of the living and the dead. I'm watching the blood moon red drip all over things, and I'm fighting against Satan. What a horrible vision. At such a time of great distress, what would we do? If we give in to fear, you and I will not be able to think clearly and fight the good fight. But if the Holy Spirit gives us strength, maybe we can recall some passages of comfort. Maybe we can recall hymn verses. And there's one in particular that's struck me. Though devils all the world should fill, all eager to devour us, we tremble not, we fear no ill. They have no power over us. This world's prince, Satan, may still scowl fierce as he will. He shall harm us none. He's judged. The deed is done. One little word shall fell him. You know that little word. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our Lord, the one who saved us from sin, death, and the power of the devil. Any of you who are concerned that Jesus Christ is not one word, we'll just go with Jesus, okay? Jesus is the one who saves us from sin, death, and the power of the devil. But Daniel tells his listeners and us that in those last days, there will be more protection from God. Do you believe in angels? Do you believe in angels? All night... All day, angels watching over me, my Lord. You teach your kids that one? Sing it in VBS. All night, all day, angels watching over me. It's a fun song to sing. Great way to teach your kids. And we learn that God's angels are always watching over us. David promised that. God will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. We all have angels watching over us all the time. You have your own stories about how you survived difficult or almost impossible situations, and we believe because of the power of angels. Daniel promises that in those last terrifying days, there will be a special angel. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, God, will arise. You can be sure that the guardian angel, Michael, is not going to come by himself. 
He is going to come with a whole heavenly host of fighting soldiers. So, we can be sure that the victory over Satan, over all the evil in this world, is certain because God has ordained it. And when we think now about the end of time and we think about heaven, we get to this part. At that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Talked about that with the children. Your name is written in the book of life and you will be saved for eternity. There are certain lists that we all would like to have our names on. Those of you who go to school, you like to know that your name is on the honor roll. Those of you who have jobs, maybe you've been honored and your name has been written in a book that says these are the people who were the employees of the year as long as this company has been going. There are scholarship awards, civic awards, sale awards, and so on. However, this list that we're talking about here is one that assures us of safety and protection from God himself and eternal life. It's good to know that our names are written in that book of life. There was a time in my ministry when one of our teachers had emergency surgery, and it happened to be on the same day that one of our students was going to begin a number of surgical procedures. And so our devotion that day was based on this verse, Isaiah 49, See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Now, I had heard about this from someone else, but we used it for devotion that day. And everybody in chapel had a pen, and we wrote the name of the teacher on our hands and the student who was beginning all those surgeries. Okay? And then we took pictures of many of the kids' hands, sent them to the hospital to our friends. It was a reminder to them that we would think about them throughout the day whenever we saw their names on our hands and that we would pray for them. And I'll tell you, it worked. If you ever want to do this for one of your friends or family, it works. Every time I extended my hand, there was the teacher's name and this student. And I remembered and I said a little prayer. Now that's impressive. That's helpful to us in our Christian faith. But here's something better. We see God said, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. So every time God extends his hands in comfort in encouragement, in blessing, you know what he sees? He sees your name. You have your name written on the hand of God. And he remembers you and he keeps his promises to you. Is there anybody here who knows the name Chuck Colson? <laughs> I have to get a new example. This name is getting too old. Chuck Colson was one of seven Watergate burglars. Okay. Chuck Colson um, broke into the Watergate building uh, at the Democratic National Headquarters to steal, a, to steal information that could influence then the next election. They were caught. They were taken to court. Chuck Colson, along with others, um, lied in court. Oh, I wasn't there. I never did anything. You know what's called when you lie in court? Perjury. Okay? He perjured himself in court. He was convicted. He was sent to prison. Chuck Colson is in prison and um, seven months into his sentence, guess what happened to Chuck Colson? He got the Holy Spirit. He became a Christian. And he started preaching to people in the prison, and he started living a good life, and he got out early on good behavior. I don't buy it. I don't like Chuck Colson. I keep a picture of him in my Bible. This reminds me of Chuck Colson. Now, you, you can't all see him, and you wouldn't recognize him, I suppose, but this man not only was a crook and a liar and a perjurer, and, in my opinion, a hypocrite. After he got out of prison, he started a prison ministry. 
and he started writing books and making money uh, selling these Christian books to prisoners and, and others who were interested in reading his story. This picture comes from a brochure that I got about guest speakers that you can have come to your group. Chuck Colson was one of the guest speakers you could have come and talk about his prison ministry. You know how much it costs to have Chuck Colson come and talk to a group? Hold your hats. $40,000 an hour. I think this man is also a profiteer. He made money on the name of Jesus. And I don't like him. Now, here's my nightmare. My nightmare is I'm going to die. I'm going to get to the pearly gates of heaven. If, you know. And God's going to say, Lauren, welcome. But, you know, I've got a lot of things I have to take care of right now. While I'm busy doing that, before I come back to you, why don't you get a cup of coffee and sit down over here with my friend Chuck? So I'm going to go over there, and I'm going to say, God, this is Chuck Colson. You know what he did? He's a crook. He's a liar. He's a perjurer. He's a hypocrite. He's a profiteer. What is he doing here? And God's going to say, whoa, that's a lot of things. Let me see what we have to say. And he's going to open this book of life. And from there, he takes out this thick book that has Chuck Colson's name on the top. And I said, yeah, is that a book of his sins? It's about the right size. Yeah. And God says, yes, it is, as a matter of fact. And he said, let's take a look and see about all these accusations you made. Hey, Lauren, hey, look at this. On the first page, it says, Chuck Colson asked for forgiveness for all his sins because of the blood of Jesus Christ. He believes Jesus Christ is his only Savior, and his sins are thereby forgiven. Look here at the rest of the book, Lauren. All these pages are blank. You know how I feel now? I feel like an idiot, right? So I take my coffee. I go back over, sit down with Chuck, and I say, Hi, Chuck, my name's Lauren Lucht. Chuck Colson stands up and says, God, this is Lauren Lucht. What's he doing here? The guy has slandered my name his entire ministry. He taught catechism classes that I was evil and sinful. He taught congregations I was evil and sinful. He blasphemed, well, that's not the word. He, he just, the, he's terrible. What's he doing here? He doesn't belong here. God says, Chuck, those are serious accusations. Come here. He digs back in that book of life and he pulls this out and Chuck goes, is that Lauren's book of sins? <laughs> Looks about right. And you know what happens now. God opens up to page one, and it says, Lauren Luck was baptized into the family of God. He was raised in the faith. He believes Jesus Christ is his only Lord and Savior from sin. He is welcome in the kingdom of heaven. That's what grace is. If you're afraid of dying, if judgment day frightens you, if the devil or your conscience attempt to convince you that you're a loser, a weak, a defeated Christian who can't win the battle, listen to this. Brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. You are a child of God. You and your soul are guarded and protected by an army of angels. You are a victor along with your Savior, Jesus Christ. Second Timothy, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. So we've talked about how frightening the last judgment will appear to be. We've talked about the greatest of God's angels will watch over and defend us. And we have heard the great promise that Daniel spoke to the people of God. Everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. The Bible is full of references to your special place in the heart of God the Father. 
He is the one who created you, gave you life. Your name is engraved on his hand. It's a reminder that he will never forget you. He's the one who wrote his name on your heart. He's the one who wrote your name in the book of life. He's the one who by the Holy Spirit has called you to faith in his son, Jesus Christ, not only to save the world from sin and death, but to save you and me and our souls. There is no reason to be afraid of Judgment Day. God has promised his angels will guard and protect all whose names are written in the book. And because of Jesus, your name is written in that book. Amen.